one more, one more minute to go and then we'll get started. Right, it's dead on 6.30, so we'll make a start. Kia ora, uh, good evening, and welcome to the Healthcare Home National Collaborative webinar on consumer engagement, involvement, and primary care. Ko Jess White Tuku Ingoa, and I co-lead the Healthcare Home National Collaborative. I've got a fantastic suite of panellists joining me here tonight, and I can't wait to share those panellists with you and their stories. But first, before we begin with our uh, introductions, we're going to move to Karakia. Tutawa mai e runga, tutawa mai e re raro, tutawa mai waho, tutawa mai roto, kito e ti Māori tu, ti Māori ora, ki te koutoa, humie, huie, taikie. Great, so as mentioned, uh, ko Jess White tuku ingoa and I'll be the chair for the webinar tonight. Um, ko Tararua Tuku manga, ko rumahanga tuku awa, no whaka ori ori a hau, uh, ki nā motu tuku kaina i nainei, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Right, we're going to start into uh, introductions of our panellists, um, and I'm going to start with Anthony, and then move to Shane, Sally and Muriel, and Lena. So, hand it over to you, Anthony, to introduce yourself. Well, kia ora koutou katoa, everybody. I'm Anthony Hill, so I've been in health for about uh, 25 years and spent some time at the ministry and the last decade was um, health and disability commissioner. And I'm now um, wandering around uh, doing some consulting on my own behalf in the sector and also associated with uh, Chen Pao. And it's a delight to be here. Thanks, Anthony. Over to you, Shane. Great, uh, Shane Gorse. So I'm the GM and one of the directors at a uh, general practice in Hawke's Bay called Tōtara Health. Um, we're a VLCA, uh, predominantly serving Māori Pacific and low-income New Zealanders, uh, about 16,000 or just over them enrolled with us. Uh, I've been in health for about two and a half years and before that um, I was a retailer by trade and also spent a bit of time uh, as the CEO of Make-A-Wish New Zealand and the charity space. So looking forward to sharing what we're doing and hoping it adds some value for all of you. Kia ora Shane. Over to you Muriel and Sally. Um, kia ora koutou. Ko um, reikawa te iwi, ko take hiku te hapu, ko Muriel tūnuho ahau. Um, I'm a patient and chairperson for the Hutt Union and Community Health Service. We're a community owned um, practice and I've been involved in community development and in the health sector for I don't know, a few decades. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, kia ora tato. My name is Sally Nicol. I manage the Heart Union and Community Health Service. Um, and I probably worked in health for just about 40 years now. Um, yeah, kia ora. Thanks, Sally. Muriel, over to you, Lena. Kia ora koutou, ko te pātu, te hapu, ko Ngāti Kahu, te iwi, um, ko Lena Hau. I am Lena and I'm a originally from the far north, um, but down in Tauranga at the moment at a practice, Chadwick Healthcare, and I'm a practice nurse and equity lead here, doing the co-design stuff. Kia ora, Lena, thank you. Thank you, panellists. Uh, so um, just before we kick into the presentations, just a reminder, if you've got any questions to pop them into the Q&A function down the bottom. We will come back to those questions at the end of all the presentations tonight. So please feel free to, to jot them down as you think about them and as you go. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Anthony, who's gonna share his slides. Thanks very much, Jess. 
So just let me uh, get the technology working. So I'm just going to share screen and see how that goes. And we should be up and running. So you should all be seeing a thing called people-centered care. I'm going to start my timer now. Jess very kindly given me about 30 minutes. So look, I'm going to um, be talking about consumer engagement, but there's a context for that. And that is the care that we deliver to the people in front of us. It's how we think about the people who are not in front of us. And of course, it's about what is happening in the system and the entities around us. So I'm going to be talking about these things tonight. So I'm going to talk about a vision for the system and how it works, which is all about how we engage with the people we get up in the morning to provide care to. I'm going to talk about what patients care about in primary care. And the reason for that is because when we're thinking about engaging with consumers, with patients, uh, with people, and I'll use those phrases interchangeably um, in the next half an hour, it's all about hearing what they think. And this is an insight into what they think and what they care about. That leads to themes um, in primary care complaints, again, coming out of my time in my previous incarnation. I'm going to turn to an example of um, consumer engagement. And again, by way of contrast, that's not a New Zealand example because A, we have several examples that are really strong and are being presented here tonight, and B, I wanted a counterpoint. Um, then we'll have a look at the health reforms. Now, um, there's an 83 pages in one single cabinet paper sitting um, on the health reforms. It's a very highly complex set of arrangements. I think very positive, but with very strong implications for consumer engagement. So I'll touch briefly on that. Again, it goes to context. And then um, time permitting, we'll talk a little bit about negotiating uncertainty and what that means in this context and at this time. So let's have a look at what the vision for a consumer-centered system is all about. And I talk and have spoken on this many times in terms of transparency, engagement, seamless service and culture. The interesting thing is that we all care about doing the right thing by the people in front of us. We all care about doing a really good job and nearly all of the time we do. But when we don't, there are some quite common elements that sit in the space of why we don't. Um, the dimensions that I talk about here are themes that became very strong as I thought about what success looks like in our environment and in consumer centered systems, consumer engagement has to be at the heart of that. Let's turn now to some of the detail. So when we talk about engagement, we talk about empowerment and um, you'll recognize um, Don Buick there and that ancient phrase now that if health's on the table, then the patient and the family must be at the table. And we also know that engagement leads to better outcomes. So it's not just a helpful suggestion, the health outcomes improve. The language of the health reforms is redolent with this kind of approach, I know. When we talk about transparency, that operates at several different layers, but again, a key feature of success is our ability to talk about the things that go well, and also the things that do not. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one today because I want to get into some of the other matters that um, are of interest to you. But I just note that if we are going to be effective in our consumer engagement, it does mean being really direct and honest about what we're seeing, both good and um where things have gone wrong. Now, the, obviously, there's a legal requirement to inform when things have gone wrong. But transparency doesn't just operate in the context of information to the consumer. It also operates in that conversation among the team and within the organisation. So an organisation that is able to have safe conversations about what is going on, what is going well and what might not be going well, or events that are causing concern, is a much safer place for patients and for staff than one that does not. So in order to keep our consumers safe and in order to continually improve and in order to actually be delivering safely, sustainably, transparency does matter. It matters because it means we're able to talk about the things that are important. If we cannot do that, then I, there is an organisation issue. So if you can't do that in your place, that's a problem that needs to be addressed. 
let's have a look um, at seamless service. And again, I note seamless service appears in the reform um, model as a priority for what um, the reforms are driving at. There's a critical idea here that um, Atul Gawande talks about. Um, you all have heard about him. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to have a bit of a look for him. He wrote um, an article in the New Yorker, which he wrote off the back of um, a speech that he'd given to a graduating um, Harvard medical class upon a time. It's really about how do we cope with complexity and what do we do in response to complexity and how do we work together? And his primary thesis through all of that was, look, upon a time, you could sit in your office and you could kind of do your thing. You could manage what was in front of you. You had enough scope to kind of anticipate where it was going to go. You had a limited range of farms. And so you could kind of think about this world and not do much about engaging with it, apart from, of course, the expertise that you brought. What he's saying now is that for some considerable time, that complexity has simply been accelerating. Complexity in terms of our understanding of the array of uh, conditions that appear and, and the way we respond to those, the technology to which we have access, and of course, the array of pharmaceuticals to which we have access. So just as three examples. And so in order to be successful, you have to be able to engage with the system and the technology in a much more intentional way. You have to be coordinated by design. And when we're thinking about consumer engagement, it comes back to how are we assisting and empowering consumers to be part of that coordination by design. I'm gonna talk more about this um, when we touch on the health reforms in um, a little bit. But it's critical that the system pieces connect. One of the most common themes that I hear when I talk around um, in primary care is some of the frustrations that um, primary care providers feel when they can't get their patients into services or when they can't get the follow-up that they need for patients or when they're not getting the feedback from other parts of the system that they need in order to provide care for their patients. So seamless service, again, is not a helpful suggestion. It's actually something that we need to deliver for the benefit of the patient. Because the problem is when the system is carrying risks around this and indeed around any of this, it's not the system's risk, it's the consumer's risk. And so we need to be effective in ensuring that seamless service. And I'm going to touch on advocacy and some other matters again when we come to the health reforms, because when a system is um, under pressure as ours is, and remember it does well nearly all of the time, it's important to notice when it is not. And so I'll come back to that later. But again, a key idea that's sitting at the heart of the health reforms, I note. I want to talk a little bit about culture because you've all heard that phrase that culture eats strategy for lunch and the way organizations behave will trump uh, the best intentions, the best policies, the best systems in the world, right? So when I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about the way we do things and I'm talking about entities in particular, organizations, be they large or small, being really clear about what success looks like at their place. And when you're talking about consumer engagement, culture is profoundly important because you need an environment where there is a genuine willingness, a genuine commitment to, and a genuine openness in the behavior that will actually achieve the end of consumer engagement. Because we all think it's a terribly good idea. And why is it then that we can't find 50 examples in New Zealand of what really good success looks like? It's because it's really difficult. There's some very, very good work being done in New Zealand. And indeed, you're about to hear some very successful examples um, in the next little bit. But if we don't have a culture in our organizations that are very much about focusing on the individual that we are serving, but about thinking about popular health, population health issues as we're thinking about those that we're not reaching. If we don't have a culture that, that enables us to talk about the things that are going right and the things that are not, and a real openness to support the team as it tries to do what it is achieving, then it doesn't matter if we change our system or it doesn't matter if we have the best protocols in the world. 
because we have to have a system where we're working openly and together to achieve that seamless service and that effective care for the people that we get up to serve. So there are a series of examples um, in the cultural space about things um, that did not go well. And they are as a result of the very human dynamics that individuals bring. So I'm gonna talk briefly about um, one example now, um, and it's from a hospital setting, but it's um, helpful in the sense of just the array of participants in it. So a situation um, arose where um, a little girl was brought by a mum to uh, an ED um, and she was pretty unwell and she had a high temp, she was breathing but fast. Uh, she was clearly off colour um, and was seen by um, a house officer. That person consulted their uh, senior colleague, um, gave the child um, some ibuprofen and the uh, child kind of settled. And so she was discharged with instructions to come back. So everything is so far okay. Then there's a second presentation uh, 24 hours later. Um, and the child is again unwell, breathing fast, high temp, um, fast pulse, a series of other indicators that say this child is actually quite unwell. Seen again by a house officer um, in ED or a junior ED person. Um, again, some drugs given and we're looking at a child who was pretty off colour but is starting to look a little bit better because the drugs um, are taking effect and she's sitting on her mum's knee and it's kind of quieter. Um, junior doc is a little concerned about um, discharge, not quite sure, uh, thinks more tests need to be done, talks to uh, the senior doc. And the senior doc um, is pretty busy. Uh, he was here in this case, he hears an array of concerns from the junior doc, looks across the room and sees um, the... Uh, child kind of sitting on her mum's knee and kind of thinks, well, you know, she's looking okay. Um, and so said we need to discharge, like really busy ED. Now, Jean Dot was concerned about that, but didn't feel that uh, they could uh, challenge the senior doc. Senior doc missed in that conversation that there were several flags that that he ought to have recognised for raising quite serious concerns about uh, the child's well-being and would have alerted him to, and should have to the need to actually have a closer look. There was more going on here. So the child was um, sent home. So second presentation, child discharged. Uh, there was a nurse in that ED who had been involved in the care of the child. When the junior doc talked to the senior doc, junior doc didn't mention to the nurse that they were about to brief the senior doc, and nobody asked the senior nurse what she thought. So about two hours later, senior nurses look around thinking, where is that child? That child should not have been discharged. Now, tragically for that family, what occurred was uh, the child was extraordinarily unwell and uh, the next 48 hours saw the child deteriorate very significantly um, and ultimately the wee girl passed away. Now, it turned out that there were some very significant underlying uh, illnesses that had not been detected hitherto um, and she was really very, very unwell. But what was taken from that family was the ability to manage what was coming well and what was taken from that little girl was the ability to assist her and to help her through what was coming. And so uh, it ended for uh, the family in a very difficult and extraordinarily traumatic way at home that need not have occurred. So the cultural question on there was why on earth didn't they talk about what needed to happen here? Because one of the things that I saw very, very consistently in my time as commissioner was that we had the saying that, you know, someone in the room knew. And it's the idea, it's not about the individual, it's about the idea that the system had what it needed to do the right thing, but something got in the way, right? 
The system had what it needed to do the right thing, but something got in the way. Do you know that in every senior case that I saw, and by the time it got to my desk, it clearly was pretty serious. We had the information, right? The system as a whole had the information it needed to do the right thing in nearly every case. Um, in fact, every serious case. But something got in the way. And in this case with this we less that I talked about, there was someone in that system who was sufficiently concerned to think that child should not be discharged and they were not even spoken to, right? So when we talk about the team and we talk about culture, we're talking about genuine engagement around the person that we're caring about. And I mentioned that case because it's not unusual. In my time, you know, in the health system and certainly in the last decade, I'd constantly come across situations where the way people behaved tragically interfered with what they were trying to do. So when I talk about culture again, it's not a helpful suggestion. It's a hard question about what are we like? What are we like in the way we talk to each other? What are the way that we like and the openness we have to each other and to the consumers? And when we talk about consumer engagement, consumers aren't engaging with just you as an individual, although that's where it starts. They're engaging with you and the entity and then the system that you're a part of. And often you are the key to their access to that system. You have a profoundly important role on helping them navigate that system. So the way we work together does matter. So I stress that, and I do that every time I talk. And the reason is simple, because it's something that I've seen too often, and it's something that we can change. And so a lot of the tools in our system are actually cultural tools about changing the way that we do things. And we won't spend much more time talking about that now, but it's worth noting there's a vast literature around this. There's a lot of science around the tools that are used. For example, the um, checklist idea uh, is a really helpful idea and in surgery. It's not only a practical tool, it's a cultural one. So culture matters. It really does go to the core of what we do. I'm going to turn now and talk about some themes um, in primary care complaints. And again, the issue here is mentioned consumer engagement, well, the best way to find out is to ask people, well, what do you think? Um, and how do you think this should look? This is what people complain about. Um, none of this will be a surprise given the vast array um, of uh, issues and presentations that are seen in primary care, but it is worth noting that um, attitude and communication appear very consistently. These don't total to 100 because it's about um, this feature, so missed, delayed, incorrect diagnosis appears in 37% of complaints, right? Each one of these elements appear in that array of complaints, which is why you don't get 100% in there, and that's a not uncommon year, okay? So those kind of things um, appear. So doing the very basic things well, making sure that we are in fact um, examining we are getting histories. Uh, we are asking the questions. We had this matra, where I still have it, of, you know, um, read the notes, ask the questions, talk with the patient. Uh, quite common uh, to see gaps in those things. So um, you can read those, and I won't spend much more time talking about them. There's no real um, surprises in there, and I will reinforce that in a couple of minutes on a, um, on a cancer slide. There are some other common themes that um, appear consistently in uh, primary care complaints. So again, when we're thinking about consumer engagement, these are the issues that present in consumers' minds when they're talking to people like the HDC, okay? Where they're provoked enough to raise a hand and say, look, I'm really, really concerned about this. Um, I flagged earlier advocacy um, as an issue. And I do want to say that I think advocacy is one of the areas where right now it's worth primary care paying a lot of attention to. And the reason for that is always going to be local and based on what is happening close to you and for your patient. 
but just echoing the fact that there are delays in certain services that we need to respond to. It might be radiology, it might be colonoscopies, it might be access to mental health services, it might be um, oncology or endocrinology. The fact is where you are aware of a patient whose situation is changing and the system doesn't seem to be responding to that, it's helpful if you can help the system respond to that. Um, so again, we can have the best consumer engagement in the world, but if we're not actually delivering the care that that patient needs, then the engagement very much becomes a second problem, doesn't it? So this, these themes are extremely uh, reliably consistent um, over time. The continuity of care issue is one that's worth reflecting on just because of the, um, the model changes that we're seeing um, over the years. And again, patients just need to be confident that the relevant information is getting to the right people at the right time. Um, when we talk about training and orientation, it's worth noting that um, when we bring new people into organisations, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we know that we don't write down and they don't know. And they'll find out, but they won't find out in a hurry. So we need to equip people promptly and competently to function effectively in your system. We have a lot of um, locums in the country and a whole array of things, um, and locums are good, they're really helpful, but you're bringing somebody in, you need to bring them in and then equip them to know um, how your system works. If they don't know how the drop downs work and how the follow ups work, they might assume that someone else is doing that. And we see a bit of that. Um, To reinforce what I've just been talking about, um, there's a report um, on the HDC website that reflects about a decade's worth of cases uh, in delayed diagnosis of cancer. Again, the recommendations there identified some recurring and very commonly seen common features in uh, delayed diagnosis of cancer in primary care. So it is worth a look um, at that report. It's still current, it's still real, and the issues have not changed. So I do not doubt that there will be, <coughs> excuse me, primary care uh, cases involving delayed diagnosis of cancer that will appear in our system uh, in 2021, uh, and they will include one or more of these elements. They are pretty solid. They're tested over time. And so I'd encourage you to be uh, familiar with those if you're in any kind of diagnostic role. Uh, they can be quite a helpful um, reinforcer of just um, doing the right thing. Let me turn to um, an example of consumer engagement from the World Federation of Haemophilia. And then I'm gonna turn to the health reforms. Uh, I'm reading seven minutes to go. Jess, I'm hoping that that's still good. Um, yeah, you're good. Seven minutes. <laughs> thanking you. The timer is working. So, to, um, and you can find more information about this on the HQC website. It's a really good model, simply because it's a it's a striking um, example of what genuine consumer engagement can look like. Where you've got, in this case, you've got a board. It's half lay, half medical. And the quotes that they talk about are quite interesting. They talk about different cultures and different ways of thinking. Um, they talk about the fact that the lay also bring their own experience and expertise um, in addition to being lay. Um, they talk about when we combine, we get better in both spheres. They talk about respect, listening and trust and a broader view of society. So if we're genuinely engaging with consumers, one of the questions is, well, so what? What are we seeing? What does that look like? What empowering is going on? Um, what kind of structures do we have? And I hesitate to say we need more structures, and I'm not saying we do, but we do need participation that is meaningful, that does empower, that does give decision rights, that does shape the way we do things, which means a genuine listening to um, what is being thought about and what is of concern, which is why I mentioned those HDC complaints, because those are the things that consumers talk about in primary care. So one of the things they'll be engaging with you about is how do we do this better, right? Um, 
the participation and partnership model here, I think, um, is quite interesting and quite helpful. So a good um, example of what you can do. We won't always be able to go half and half on the decision-making body, but consumer representation in decision-making spaces, I think, is very, very important. Um, and I'd encourage us to be very active there. And in New Zealand, we've got some really good examples um, of that. Let's turn now um, with five minutes to run. I want to just touch on the health reforms a little bit because they show very significant opportunities for engagement in primary care. Now, there are a lot of change coming. Um, I think it's really exciting. And I'm, I was really pleased when I saw uh, direct, the direction of travel and some of the rationale for it. Um, so again, you'll be familiar with this. So I'm not going to go into any detail. I'm going to pick the eyes out in relation to consumer engagement though, because I think there's a massive opportunity right now um, in primary care in particular, because you're so close to communities, you know people, you know who's coming, but you also know who's not coming, which leads very strongly into the equity space, which is somewhere where we need to invest and we need to see change. Um, so the prioritise the priorities for the system are sitting there as um, evidenced in the cabinet paper, which you can see on the DPMC website. But there is a lot about empowering people and giving people meaning for con control over the services they receive and treating patients as experts. So come back to the vision that I outlined at the beginning, an engaged consumer gets better health outcomes, right? And as we treat people as experts, and we see this, um, there's really good examples in long-term conditions um, in New Zealand, but we know health outcomes are better. So the reforms are expressly picking up those themes. Um, when it talks about system shifts, um, we pick up um, reinforcing te tiriti or Watangi principles. We talk about accessing comprehensive services locally. That word empowered comes up, the word seamlessly, about services connecting comes up, strong emphasis on dis digital and getting people um, care in their homes. As an aside, they talk about um, virtual uh, consults became really, really strong through um, the height of the pandemic and then have reverted uh, pretty much to pre-pandemic levels. So there's going to be some work done there. And of course, valuing those um, who work in health and healthcare. Flexibility and localities um, are again key themes in these reforms and people's um, being people being empowered to design locally. And so there's a very strong message here about getting in front of consumer engagement. Why? Because the system reforms are talking about we want to be engaging with local communities and giving those people the authority to design services for their environment. So I think this huge um, opportunities, which means it's a really good time uh, to be getting in front um, on consumer engagement. In the one, in one minute and 45 seconds that remain to me, I'm just going to show the last slide, because I think as we negotiate transition, um, it's really important to keep the main thing the main thing. As one writer would famously say, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. When you've got a lot of moving parts, the main thing is always about us providing really, really good care to the consumers that we are providing care to. It means incorporating all of those elements that I talked about earlier, about engagement, about seamless service, about empowering people, about trust, about placing the person genuinely at the center. It also means that uh, we wanna make sure that we protect uh, patients from isolation, and by that I mean theirs and provider isolation. So it's important that the system relationships stay really strong, particularly um, as we are transitioning in the next 12 to 24 to 36 months. We do need to be moving now on the equity um, space and reaching out to those who aren't showing up. And primary care is really strong on this because it knows where those folks are. I've already talked about advocacy, and as we see prioritization and access under pressure, it's important that primary care steps into that and speaks into that and acts as an advocate 
um, in those particular spaces for um, consumers. So I'm going to finish there. I think it's a really good time to be getting in front um, on consumer engagement. I think the reforms raise some really exciting possibilities for working with consumers and communities uh, to deliver and design services. And I think now's a really good time to be getting in front. So uh, thank you. And uh, Jess, I'll hand over to you. Sure, thank you, Anthony. Um, I see a few questions come through, but we will come back to those at the end. I just want to pass it over to Shane to present. Thanks, Jess. So uh, I've, I've got some stuff I'm going to show you folks, but um, for, the, for the time being, I'm just going to talk. So um, as I said, at the start, uh, I'm from an organisation called Tōtara Health in Hawke's Bay. Uh, so we have just over 16,000 patients um, and just over 70% of them are Māori Pacific or low income. Um, I suppose what the system would call high needs, but we uh, tend to uh, prefer to refer to our community as underserved because um, we think that defines um, far more accurately uh, what's actually going on out there. Um, the organisation has been serving the community that they serve for uh, close enough that makes no difference to 40 years. Uh, and our clinical director, who's still in the business today, uh, is, you know, started in the community of Flaxmere uh, because that's the community that she's always wanted to serve and um, is uh, the sort of personality where she can't quite go to the supermarket without being stopped 57 times because she's, uh, as well as having a general practice 40 years ago, she was also the only female obstetrician in Hawke's Bay. Uh, so, as you can imagine, she knows lots of families. Um, and uh, I suppose the, the way that our organisation would be described in modern terms is as a social enterprise. Um, I suppose we'd put it a bit more simply than that and just say that we, we try and run a good business so that we can afford to invest uh, in community programmes directly, uh, as opposed to having to reach out to external organisations and have them funded. And uh, the programme I'm going to talk to you about tonight, um, our Fano Voice program uh, is one of those programs that we were able to self-fund um, uh, initially uh, and that, that had its challenges which I'll also uh, discuss with you. So uh, we were in part inspired by uh, the NUCA um, model of care and wanting to um, build uh, the same sort of relationship with our community that they have with theirs uh, for those of you that are familiar. Um, but at its foundation, our objective was to, rather than um, participate in a series of surveys or gather a bunch of data about what our consumers' um, thoughts and, and desires were about healthcare, we wanted to um, build an a, build a iterative and ongoing dialogue with our community um, that gave us a genuine representation of consumer voice. Um, and gave them, you know, gave our community that real sense of tangible ownership over not just um, what sort of services we delivered, but how we deliver them. Um, and you know, I, I would describe us as still at our infancy in terms of uh, our learning around this space, uh, and it is a very challenging space to do really, really well. Um, but I'll, I'm going to step you through the first few steps of that journey for us um, so that you can understand how we've chosen to go about it and some of the pitfalls that we've, we've learned about along the way. Um, so the first step we took was, and we went to reasonably significant lengths to find the right partner to work with in this space. Um, and we did that because the most important thing about this external organisation for this piece of work is that they were going to have a more direct relationship with our patients than than many many other of any any other sort of external agency that we've ever worked with. Um, and over forty years of history in the community, we've built quite a strong relationship. So we don't um, we're not necessarily that eager to hand that over um, with great enthusiasm, unless we we you know we have a high degree of confidence that the organisation that's going to be working with our whānau is aligned with us not only in its objectives but in its values uh, and in its culture um, to uh, reinforce a point that Anthony made. Uh, so we found that uh, in an organisation called Focal, um, who are a little Hawke's Bay business, um, which I'll talk a bit more about as we go through. 
So the first phase of our um, development of this dialogue, if you like, uh, we call the understanding phase and um, quite simply so that it you know, sort of does what it says on the tin. It was about um, getting a broad understanding about the thoughts and feelings and understanding and interpretation of what health and wellness meant for our community and how well they thought we were delivering whatever that was. Um, so we set about um, engaging with 50 of our Fano, five zero, so 25 from our Nelson Street practice, which is in Central Hastings, and 25 Fano from our uh, Flaxmere practice. Um, the next really important thing uh, that we learned or that we, we decided was that the people who were actually going to do the work needed to be the right type of people. And because the relationship that these whānau have is with us, they needed to be our people. So as opposed to sending, uh, you know, specifically research staff or, you know, staff that, that um, spend their time having these sorts of conversations into the homes of our whānau, um, we engaged with our kaya whina. So we have kaya whina on staff who um, run some of our, our community outreach programs. Uh, so we got them to sit with the, the experts, if you like, from Focal and be trained on um, the sorts of things they needed to understand in order to be able to engage in the dialogue we needed them to have. Uh, and that, I think, um, although we didn't realise it at the time, was probably one of the most important aspects of the way we set about consumer engagement as we had the right group of people with the right understanding of the whanau they were going to be talking to uh, with some knowledge from some subject matter experts on how to have the conversation and how to structure it and how to explore things, you know, as they came up um, to get the the richest, most meaningful engagement with those whānau we could. So uh, it took some time, and time is time is probably one of the most challenging things that we've found in terms of this this program because uh, it's it's the one thing that we all have very little of. Um, and uh, particularly in our community, you know, high, high percentage of Māori and Pacific, um, the relationship has to come first. And if there's no relationship, there's, you know, nothing's going to happen, um, which meant that, you know, we, you, we couldn't just go knocking on front doors expecting that they were going to welcome us with open arms and share with us, you know, this sort of intimate view of, of the well-being of them and their whānau. So we had to allow our kaiafina to spend the time necessary to really, um, you know, reinforce that trust relationship before they started to dive too deeply into um, asking direct questions and trying to get some information um, in that regard. So sometimes these interviews, these individual interviews with Fano went on for, you know, several hours, and sometimes we had to go back two or three times and um and really make sure that we explored things to a level that gave us um the results that I'll, I'll share with some some of them with you soon um so once that work was done uh then we went out to to i suppose um quantify and and qualify some of the things that we were hearing from Fano um consistently with the wider population so we did that by uh, incorporating surveys. So we went online, um, pushed a lot of it out online through social media and things like that. And we also um, set up iPads in our waiting rooms. Um, so, uh, and got our team to start encouraging people to fill out surveys, surveys that were designed off the back of what we had found so far in, the, in that deep engagement with those whānau. Um, and that produced you know, some very, very rich information. Uh, that we could then uh, give to our experts uh, and they could thematically analyse um, that and give us something which is um, you know, able to be actioned and, and uh, interpreted and, um, and integrated into our strategy and our services moving forward. Um, I suppose it's an important point to make in terms of that part of the process is not only was it important for the people that went and did the work to be the right people properly trained uh, with the right relationships, but it was important for our partner 
focal in this process that they when they were doing what they do with all of their analysis that you know which is what they do for a living they actually had our people sitting with them helping them to interpret some of the uh, responses that they were hearing um, because culturally speaking um, you know, all of our kaiafena are Māori and the the guys from Focal are very, very good at what they do, but they're not Māori. Um, and there were, it was really interesting to see the difference in the interpretation and the learning for them as an organisation about um, how different things are expressed and, and viewed um, uh, through a, a Māori lens, if you like. So... Um, I'll just share my screen for a minute and show you a little bit of um, the outcome of that. So, so this is just what's on the screen at the moment is just the the report that we got from this phase, and this was uh, two years ago now um, that we did this first piece of work. And I won't I won't go through verbatim some of the feedback that was said, but I'll just leave that up there while I keep talking so you can have a bit of a read. And hopefully what you'll get is a bit of a feeling for the sorts of insights that we got about the different areas um, that we asked them about. So phase, um, phase two was where we kind of had a wall. Um, we got started with phase two just before COVID and then COVID turned us on, on our heads. But the mistake we made in the, and probably one of the biggest tips I have for you tonight is um, once you start, you've got to maintain momentum. You've got to do it at all costs because um, it's not a cheap exercise. It's not uh, cheap in financial terms or in, in terms of time. And if you lose that momentum, it damages the relationship that gives you that richness of information in the first place. You've got to be able to feed back and keep those people engaged and show them that you're doing something with it. Um, so phase two, we had to find a more sustainable way to do it because obviously having a number of staff going out, spending that degree of time, getting to that level of depth with 50 Fano is uh, an extremely expensive exercise and we couldn't afford to keep funding it at that level every month, month on month forever. Um, so we moved to um, a more streamlined model um, and focused on particular areas of health and wellbeing. So what I've got up on the screen now is actually um, one of the first modules we did after COVID, which was around telehealth. How am I going for time there, Jess? Five, sweet. So um, I'll show you some of the results from that in a moment so you can get some context. But this, uh, this first slide is essentially what we came up with to uh, simplify or to present back to people that aren't involved in the program or, or you know, in our own organization what it is we were trying to achieve and what the important steps were. Um, and that listen and learn part, we got really, really um, right in phase one. Um, where it got really hard was the act. And the reason it got hard uh, was twofold. One, um, it's not always easy to translate the actions you take from what you learn. Um, into anything meaningful for the people that, that gave you the information in the first place. Uh, and that can leave them feeling like this was just another survey, this was just another bunch of questions, it's not actually gonna go anywhere, it's not gonna change anything. And that doesn't achieve that ongoing dialogue and that meaningful level of ownership. The other reason that acting can be challenging is that we all know we operate within uh, some pretty tight constraints in terms of funding and resources and other things. So you've got to be able to have the conversation with people that participate in this process. Um, you know, and again, to allude to something Anthony said, it's about that transparency. Um, so you, whether or not you can do what the, you know, what the consumer is asking you to do, you need to be transparent about that with them. So we found ourselves having to have conversations we weren't expecting about, these are the things that you told us that we can do something about and this is what we're doing. But actually there's a whole bunch of stuff here that you told us about that we can't do anything about. You know, being honest about what you can and can't deliver um, because sometimes the expectations or the, I suppose the utopic, utopic, 
you know, view of what health should look like um, is just at a level that the current system can't meet. So um, it's about having that transparent conversation, but as long as you're transparent about that, it's the getting back to people and demonstrating that this is not just a one-way relationship where they give us their time and information and we go away and, and never speak to them again. So that loop and closing that loop is really important. Um, so just to quickly share with you before I run out of time, uh, you know, telehealth has, has obviously become a much bigger part of our lives much faster than we expected pre-COVID. So we wanted to, you know, test, I suppose, what we thought people thought about our telehealth service. And I think that that happens a lot in, in general practice is we, we think we have a pretty good idea of what people think about stuff. You know, we get anecdotal feedback and, you know, you, you get, get a bit of intuition for it. But uh, it's always interesting to go out and test that with, with your community and, and, and sometimes be a bit surprised by the answers. So we asked a range of questions around satisfaction. So you can see that there. Um, so what I'm actually showing you is this, these are slides that display on TVs in our waiting room. So this is part of closing the feedback loop. So this is the, what did you tell us part of that, if you like. Um, we also include, these are all real quotes from patients that they've, you know, that they've shared with us. Uh, and we try and make sure that we don't skew the result, you know, in terms of what we present back. We, we don't exclude negative comments because they're negative. And that can be quite difficult sometimes too, because it's sort of, it feels a bit critical, but actually that, that balance is really important. So we have a bit of a warts and all uh, approach in terms of that. As you can see, you know, satis again, satisfaction around the consultation service. And again, what they've told us laid out pretty clearly, um, you know, what their preferences are. So that's an interesting, slide in terms of consultation preference. So, um, you know, 54.6 prefer a combination. So that's a useful piece of information for us uh, in terms of how we continue uh, as we settle into this new normal. And then this is the really important bit uh, at the end of every feedback loop, which is, well, what are we actually doing about what you're telling us? Uh, so in terms of telehealth, we, you know, we tried to pick out what are the things that, that they don't like um, about it and what can we do about that um, and in what sort of time frame can we do it uh, and having this sort of feedback coming back to the people that have participated in this process um, is, is a really powerful part of it. Um, to close off I think that the three most or the probably four or five most important things that I've mentioned you know, in terms of in, engaging in this sort of work one is the right partner for the reasons I talked about um, Two is the right team to engage, the right people having the conversations. Uh, three is the energy and investment to maintain the momentum. Um, four is a willingness to innovate uh, and try and find creative ways to deliver what people ask for. Um, and sometimes you do have to get quite creative. And five is that, that last point around just the willingness to be transparent about what you can and cannot do um, and, uh, and, and being honest about that. Uh, the biggest mistakes that we've made along the way, one was um, under-investing. We didn't commit enough budget to do the work properly, uh, and that was part of why we lost momentum. Um, two was the stop-start approach that was partially caused by COVID, but in reality was just caused by um, probably the third pitfall, which is trying to do too much too quickly. Uh, so... Yeah, that's, that's kind of a, a, a very brief summary of our journey so far. Um, it's, uh, as I say, an ongoing thing for us. Um, and the next, the next phase of this, as we, as we work our way through this more modular kind of approach and try and build that momentum back up is um, that I haven't had time to talk about tonight is around managing the data um, and really getting your head around how the relationship with these people that are engaging with this process needs to work ongoing to keep them engaging over time. Um, so thank you very much. I hope that that's been somewhat helpful um, and I uh, appreciate Jess providing the opportunity for us to uh, come on here and talk about some of our mahi. Great, thank you Shane, that, that was brilliant. And, and I mean, yeah, the whole what's and all thing I think is really important. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so I'm going to hand it over to Sally and Muriel. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, yeah, we were, are going to share um, share the screen, I think, to um, bring up our Tikiti Hauora presentation. <coughs> um, okay. Let's see. Oh, sorry, this might have to go back a bit here. We've got a little preview of everything. Um, so, Heart Union and Community Health Service. Um, we are a community owned organisation, so we already have a governance board which has got staff and patients and others on it. So we have come from a kind of um, a situation where we see it as really normal for our community to be involved in, um, in everything, planning, decision making and everything. Um, we got specifically involved with the patient advisory group in 2018, and that was as part of the Health Quality and Safety Commission Faka Kotahi programme. Um, where we did a diabetes improvement initiative. Um, and it, in that we, are, we used patients who were identified by the staff team and had very structured face-to-face -face sessions, which I'll talk, talk more about in, this, in a minute. Um, the sessions were structured so that the first half of the session was um, our sharing information with our patients who were at the table. And the second half of the session was that they shared information and ideas and responses with us. Um, the information that we were sharing with them for that particular project was that we would do a session on diabetes so that we had a kind of 10 sessions and I can't remember the order but we did one on diabetes um, basic diabetes basics, one on diabetes and medications, one on diabetes and exercise. Um, so we, we thought over the course of the 10 sessions we were upskilling our patients and, and diabetes to allow them to then feed back to us better information. Um, at the same time, we did um, upskilling them on um, improvement processes. So we would talk about quality improvement processes and tools. Um, yeah, and then they would give us many ideas and thoughts and we would run ideas past them in the second half. Um, basically, the sessions were shaped around the idea of a basket of knowledge where we all shared expertise, experience, um, and ideas. And all of those ideas from staff and patients who are equally valued and gained something by putting the two together. Um, we re-established Kiti Hauora in 2020 and initially used a workbook to collect and share knowledge because of the social distancing with COVID. And also we were just scared we were gonna go in and out of lockdown and lose momentum. And I totally take on board Shane's point because mm -hmm. we did lose momentum at times and it's, it's not good. <laughs> Um, and the workbook had the same kind of formatting. So one page would be something about us. The next page would be patients to write and for, for them. Um, the current group is currently focused on promoting flu vax and COVID vaccination or giving us ideas for how to promote them well. We thought it might be helpful just to take one particular session and talk about that to give a kind of a clearer idea of how it worked. And this is actually session number four, I think, of the diabetes project. Um, so it was a two-hour face-to-face session which had staff and patients at the table and we did a quality tools learning session on PDSA cycles and talked about how they worked and how they could be useful when planning a project. And then our physiotherapist did a session on exercise and diabetes and the advantages of um, exercising for people with diabetes. Um, the patients, we kind of mm -hmm. talked about what they thought about diabetes and exercise, and they spontaneously came up with the idea of putting the PDSA cycle and the exercise together. And actually, they wanted to design an exercise group. They thought they could do it better than the kind of ones they were offered out there already. They thought maybe they could get more people there. It could be um, much more appropriate. And at that session itself, lots of ideas flowed about the name and what music we should use and how to promote it, mm -hmm. how to get family involved in it. Um, and by the end of the session, we had a work plan and actually our Tuiora exercise group started one month later. Um, not every session had the same kind of um, discussion. Some of them would be those patients feeding back to us on our own forms and ideas and whether or not they were getting out of the consultations what they wanted at a diabetes annual review or something. So that, there was a wide range of information that came back to us. Um, and again, taking on Shane's point, it's really, really important to show patients that you not only value what they're telling you, but how you end up using what they're, what they're giving you. Um, I'll just hand over to Muriel for the next part of this. Sorry, Muriel. 
Yep. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to speak to the next three slides. Um, and this photo is a photo of just some of our um, patients that were advised, uh, involved in our advisory group. Um, and as Sally's already explained, we had 10 sessions and after each session, every participant uh, received a certificate. Um, and I thought that was really significant because um, I was thinking about one of the patients, um, Ronnie, who was really, really excited and she'd never, ever had a certificate, you know, she was a grandmother um, and this was a big thing for her. And I think this is what we were also conscious of um, was kind of like having that mutual respect for each other um, and I guess what um, Anthony mentioned is treating our patients as experts um, as well. Um, I think this group also had the opportunity, we were invited to present at the um, Quality Commission's first consumer um, conference in Wellington. Um, and each of our, the, our patient participants, um, they all had a role um, in it. They all spoke um, to the slides in our presentation. Um, and I particularly remember Kamal, one of our um, patients, who was able to speak to the slide and the data um, really, really confidently, um, actually. So I think that for us, that was a big investment of seeing um, our, having the opportunity to help grow um, those potential leaders. And the next. Um, this photo, is, as Sally's already mentioned, um, Toy Order was the, um, the co-design group um, came out of Te Kete Ho Order advisory group. So um, the photo is a, is, is a group photo of the participants um, and the physiotherapist. Um, and it was already, you know, it was a really exciting um, program um, that they were determined to own um, and run and lead from the outset. And many of them had different roles. Um, they weren't just sort of like turning up only to participate in um, some physical activity. I think they also became real leaders of taking their experience and the knowledge they were able to, um, you know, they were taking on board back to their families um, as well. And that, this is what kind of kept a real, I think that buzz and it kept, helped keep that momentum, but that um, it was something that they were really, really proud about and fully engaged um, in the process as well. Um, so in terms of some of the top tips, I think our experience is that, you know, we've found um, co-design has been really, really fun. And I acknowledge the comments and agree with some of the comments is that um, there have been challenges along the way and it is time consuming as well. But um, I think the rewards um, we've seen through that whole experience um, has, has, has been really great. Um, I think our top tips are grounded in our own, um, I guess, the culture or the values of our organisation. Um, and I think this is why these tips are within that context and these values, I guess, is what helped, um, it felt like a natural fit. This is what helped build the framework and context around how we approached um, the whole co-design with our patients as well. Um, so Manaki Tanga, I think that was, you know, we were being really, really intentional and conscious about ensuring we were building a safe um, and, and comfortable environment for everybody uh, to, to participate, um, both patients and staff, together and where everybody felt like they had something of value to contribute. And there was a real exchange um, of ideas um, and people feeling really genuinely valued. Um, for knowing a tanga completely, the comments I think, um, Shane, you said really resonated um, around the importance of building those relationships. Um, I think in our experience, everyone, when we put out the invitation to the first group, uh, I mean, to the group to come to the first hui, they were all approached and invited by somebody in the practice that they knew personally, whether it was the community health worker that invited them or their nurse 
or the GP, somebody that they had made personally made a connection to in the practice is who um, invited them uh, to come along. And I think that was a learning process for everybody that everybody um, really valued um, in that as well. I think one of our top tips is is about really investing in your co-design group to succeed. Um, and for us, that meant ensuring that all of our sessions were planned uh, carefully um, and ensuring that you had the right mix of skills and knowledge that were in the room um, you know, to help participate and keep up the flow of those conversations as well. We found the, um, the Health and Quality Safety Commission um, quality improvement tools were really helpful and they helped give us structure um, also to our, our weekly sessions. Um, so that was really valuable. Um, I, we also found that you know, both structure and flexibility were important. Um, and there's a problem when you become rigid about things. So I think you know, it was really, we were kind of conscious about knowing when when was the right time to lead and when was the right time for us um, to step back as well and allow that um, space for our patients to, to contribute. Um, and, you know, they never failed, really. They've been um, amazing participants and leaders. And in a lot of ways, we've lost some of those on our original group because they've gone on to different roles, still in the health sector um, as well. But now we've got um, the opportunity to keep growing um, that group um, with a new cohort now. But I think we've always approached, um, I guess, the engagement with patients along the, you know, that's been consistent with our values and to take more of a community development um, approach. It's not just about us trying to deliver a service to somebody or to just to kind of invite them to give feedback. We see this as a, re has, it's been a real opportunity of full engagement with them where um, we're able to give them um, some valuable information, but actually create the space to kind of hear and understand their, um, not only their own learnings, but the gifts that they also have to contribute. Um, so that's all I wanted to add there. And but just before closing, I'll just check and see if Sally's got anything additional to say. No, I think, that, I think that's us. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jess. Yeah. Great. Hello. Thanks, Mary and Sally. Uh, I, I, we had a question, and I will ask it while we've got you on. Did, is there any reasons for the different coloured scarves? Someone asked that of the exercise group. They're not scarves. They're those stretchy the elastic stretch. physio things. Oh, there we, we go. Do need a gym, so the physio just bought just of course, squeezes yeah, that. I don't know what it's called technically. But everyone took them home, and actually they chose them by colour. So people got attached to certain colours. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and there was also a question there around community development. But Mira, I think you've touched on it and, and emphasised the, the really importance of that community development approach. So thank you. Yeah. Right. OK. Last but not least, Lena, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Jess. It's been awesome listening to everyone else's journeys through this co-design um, journey. Um, so here's ours at Chadwick Healthcare. Um, we're relatively new to this whole co-design thing. We started the HQSD project um, last year, the beginning of last year, so that's been great. Um, we decided to use a uh, Māori Whakatauki or proverb to name our project, so that's He Waka Eke Noa, which translates to we're all in this together, which was very fitting. Um, <clears throat> so Chadwick Healthcare, we are a large mainstream practice in Tauranga. We have four different clinics throughout Tauranga and our staff rotate between all the different clinics. Um, overall, we have 13,242 enrolled patients and 1,421 of them are Māori. So um, quite a small number of Māori. The overall uh, population for the Tauranga area is 16% Māori, I think. So we are 
at the beginning we wanted to increase our here it is to increase our enrolled Māori patient population to better represent the area. So at the moment we're at eleven percent, and it is growing slowly. Um, so we're trying to do whatever we can to make that grow a little bit faster. Um, so we want to improve engagement with our Māori patients and communities and feel like that will help us grow our patient population as well. Um, so to start our project, we looked at the baseline data, so how many our current Māori patient population and the amount of DNAs we had. Uh, which wasn't too bad compared with non-Māori, but um, yeah, we hope to improve that too. Um, we created elevator pitches for staff and patients to create buy-in. Um, so that was sort of just a short blurb saying what our aim was um, and to get people to participate. That was really hard. It was hard to get people engaged, um, especially patients. So we, we sent out letters to start with, didn't get much response from that because nobody reads letters. Um, so we ended up just sort of, as patients came in and we were seeing them and building that relationship, um, we'd tell them about what we were doing and that was the best way that we got them to engage and say, yeah, we're keen to come along and help you out. Um, so we then had a staff lunch so that everyone, because we are quite a large practice and we all rotate around, so we just wanted everyone to know what we were doing in case patients came in and asked anyone. Um, and we also got staff, um, found staff who were keen to help us out with anything we needed to do. Um, so the actual engagement with patients was done through HUI and survey. We've done one survey um, and two HUI since last year. And we'll talk about that a bit more soon. So before we had our first HUI with the patients, we were lucky to have support from um, the equity team at the PHO as well as a co-design expert. Uh, who helped facilitate the hui. Um, she was great in sort of focusing the conversation. Uh, so this is what we've done. Our, our first hui was in October last year. Um, we had five patients attend. Actually, there were th two of those were patients, three of them were patients Bano. So it was good having people come along who weren't actually enrolled with us. Some of them were previously enrolled with us and they gave us some good feedback about what we could do. Um, so for the hui, we, um, we didn't want to sort of set any expectations or anything. We just let them know that we're trying to improve our services for Māori and Firstly, want to know what their current experiences are and what they think we can do better. Um, so yeah, we had five patients come, three staff. That was our equity team. Um, so that's myself, uh, our health coach, and our practice assistant. Um, and then we had our co-design expert and PHO support as well from the equity team up there. Um, we got really good feedback from that one and engagement. It was quite a small group, so it was easy for everyone to have their say and share their ideas. Uh, the next hui we held was in December last year, and that was slightly bigger. So we had 12 patients. Some of those were made up of Fano as well. Um, at the previous hui, they said that it would be good if we could have management there. We didn't want to bring management first because we didn't want to make them feel like they couldn't share things. Um, but yeah, so we brought management along to the next one and also the um, support from the PHO team as well. Um, that was really hard because the conversation sort of diverted 
quite a bit and it went really off topic and not everyone got to have their say because there were so many people there. It, we still got some really good feedback, but we learned from that um, sort of if we're having hui to have smaller smaller groups, so it's easier for everyone to have their say. Um, and then we've done a staff and patient survey. We left the open question there um, asking how people think that, how well we think how well they think um, their cultural needs are being met and just let, left a comment box and we got some really good answers from that. Uh, and also got them to measure the importance of each pillar of Te Tapafa, which was good um, because in our current sort of model, we focus lots on the physical health and don't look at the other things um, like wairua tanga, uh, Heningaro, which is mental health, and whānau. Um, and then we measured that against, we measured the patient uh, answers against the staff answers. Gave us a good idea where we were at. Um, for, her, for, for patients attending, they gave their time to attend our hui and give us the feedback. So we thought Rungua Māori would be a nice way to sort of, because it's, it's a Māori based thing, so we wanted to give them a nice koha um, and acknowledge Rungawa Māori as sort of out there. We gave them kawakawa bam and also pack and save vouchers because um, they can be used for gas and food as well. Um, so our suggestions that we got from the hui were to have Māori artwork in the waiting room that would, they said that that would make them feel sort of more welcome when they walked in. So our practice owner went and sourced this piece that you can see here um, from a local weaver. And that's beautiful, I think. Um, we've had lots of good feedback on that. And now we're also looking for other pieces to have at our other clinics. Um, other, sorry, my dog just come home. Other, other suggestions that we had was to say kia ora on the, on the answer phone message rather than hello. Um, so kia ora not only means hello, but it's also um, used to wish someone well. Uh, so we changed that. We've had some good feedback and some patients that aren't happy about it. Um, we are predominantly non-Māori practice. So yeah, we did have some complaints, but it's still there and it's, yeah, the good outweighs the bad. Um, another one was to have more spaces for iwi on, the, on our enrollment forms. There was only one on our online enrollment form, but our MedTech um, CMS has three spaces. So we got that updated to three. We weren't even aware that that was that there was only one space on the enrollment form. So little things like that were good to pick up. Um, music in the waiting room, just like having the artwork in the waiting room made them feel more welcome. So we have uh, got that added to our health TV thing that we had in the waiting room. Um, a common theme that came out in both hui was the importance of knowing a tanga, which the last two have into that as well. So building rapport and trusting relationships with with the patients to make them feel comfortable to share these types of things is really valuable. Um, and also increasing staff understanding and awareness of Māori culture. They thought that was very important too. Um, so results over the past six months, our Māori patient population has increased from 11.6% to 12%, so marginally, but it has increased. Um, but it's interesting to note that of our new enrolments, 16.8% were Māori, so that's a good number to be looking at. Um, we haven't been going long, so we still hope to see changes into the future. Um, workplace initiatives that we have started to sort of increase Māori understanding 
cots or tower Māori understanding among our staff to make patients feel more comfortable and understood when they come in. Um, so we established a Māori health team, which we've now changed to the equity team. Um, and we're working on the foundation standards just to get the basics right. Um, we've been doing regular intranet updates. So because we have four practices across different locations, uh, we have an intranet page that we can all access and we all look at daily. So there's a little bit on there um, that just sort of gives people a reminder of pronunciation. It also, we've also put things on there like a bit of background on things like Matariki and Waitangi Day just to, just so it's there for people to learn really. Um, another cool thing that we've done is started te reo classes. So we've got 12 of our staff completing te reo Māori classes, which are through Te Wānanga o Aotearoa. And that is really helping with pronunciation and just you know, getting people to talk about pronunciation in the workplace is a great start, I think. Um, yeah, so that's really cool. Some of the challenges we faced was time. Um, it's been really hard to find time to do this all, but it is very important to make the time. Um, the engagement and participation at the start was really hard to get our patients engaged um, or to even understand what we were doing because they just come to us to see a doctor and yeah didn't see the, the point of what we were trying to do. Um, outdated perceptions. I think that was sort of yeah just about increasing knowledge of te ao Māori among staff. Um, and keeping conversation on topic during hui, it's what I talked about before, the larger hui was hard to hard to keep things focused. So in the future, we'll be holding smaller groups. Um, another thing we've struggled with, which the other two have said is momentum, keeping the momentum up has been hard, especially with the COVID lockdowns and flu season coming up now and the COVID vaccines. Um, definitely been a challenge it, yeah made it hard so in conclusion to increase engagement with our Māori communities we must first ensure a widespread understanding of Māori culture and tikanga Māori throughout the workplace this creates a welcoming environment and a safe space where our patients feel will feel welcome and confident to share their health journey without fear of judgment <clears throat> Enrollments will then increase through word of mouth, hopefully. And we have seen that, and we have noticed the people that are coming in to enroll um, have come in because, you know, blah, blah, blah said you're doing this. So we thought we'd come in and enroll here. Um, yeah, and that's us at Chadwick. Thank you for listening. Sure, Elena, that's, that was great. We've got. Um, one question for you, um, and that is, did the name of the project, Hewaka Ignore, did that come from the co-design group or had you decided on that name prior? No, that that sort of just, that was us looking for something. We did discuss it with the group, um, but that was, yeah, it wasn't fully discussed with them. They thought it was a good idea. Um, but sort of we decided it, which isn't actually co-design, but that's how we've done that one. Great, thank you. Um, and another question here, um, how did you choose the staff that were on the team and any tips for getting buy-in from the whole of staff for support for this kind of project? Um, Elena, do you answer that? Yeah, the staff that we got, um, so we done that lunch that I talked about. We'd done a lunch with all the staff to tell them what we were doing. And of course, there were some that were a lot more interested than others. So we wanted people that were going to be interested and wanted to do this uh, mahi. So we chose those ones. Uh, what was the other bit of the question? 
um, getting buy-in from the whole staff. So how do you feed that back to all the rest of the staff? Yeah, I don't think we're ever going to get buy-in from all the staff, but we got a large majority of them talking about it and interested in it, which was good just to have those conversations with people um, and spark interest. What about you, Shane? How do you get your whole team on board and share the learnings, what comes from your uh, feedback from your patients? Um, part of that is, is work that we've been doing over the last um, two or three years. So um, we're at a stage where we're the biggest Māori or provider to Māori in Hawke's Bay, um, even though we're not the Māori provider. Um, and along with that comes a, a high representation of Māori and Pacific staff. So 75% of our customer service staff are Māori or Pacific. Uh, and the same percentage of our nurses are. Um, so I think in terms of where we are on the journey, you know, um, if anything, there's a bit of pressure for us um, to do more of this and to engage more with the sorts of things that Lena was outlining their finding as they as they begin to try and increase their engagement with Māori. Um, because as, as a large provider with a large number of Māori um, and large team of Māori and Pacific working for us, you know, they, and as when we encourage them to hold us accountable for how good a job we're doing in that space. Um, so we're a little bit blessed in that regard. In terms of the non-Māori and non-Pacific staff, it has been a little bit more difficult, um, but uh, I think it's that comes back to what Anthony talked about around the culture of the organisation. Um, so if, you know, one thing we worked really hard on is making sure everybody understood our purpose and our purpose is uh, to enable our whanau to enjoy the opportunities and benefits that come with well, being well, with wellness. And if they understand that and you've got buy into that purpose, then they see you doing this work and it makes sense. So, you know, if you've got the culture right, that's when the buy in starts to build some momentum. Um, and I think you know, the work that you're doing later there is really important and it'll be, it'll feel like pushing stuff uphill for a little while, but it is exactly the right sort of thing to be doing and, and people will get more and more excited about it. So keep going. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. What about, you know, any last comments from you, Mural Stelly, about getting your team on board and keeping the mahi going and integrating the feedback back? You know, I think it's not all that easy to get everyone involved just because, like everyone else, we're really, really busy and doctors are doing doctor stuff and nurses are doing nurse stuff. And the amount of time they have in their day to come out of it is not, not great. Um, keeping them in the loop of it is really important. For us, they've been, they've been very good at shoulder tapping people to come into it. So mm -hmm. while it may be get, going past them in many ways, they know it's important. And when they come across a patient who seems keen, they'll often kind of say to them, we've got a um, patient advisory group, would you like to be on it? So, yeah, I think they're, they're keen, but honestly, time makes it really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I appreciate we've only got three minutes left, and I've just got a couple of slides I wanted to share. Um, with everyone as we finish off. Sorry, I'll just get to this. So um, here in the Healthcare Home uh, Collaborative website, we have our model of care and it is an interactive model of care. So there is resources that sit behind each one of these characteristics. So you can see here the two that I have circled 15.1 patient engagement and 15.2 patient experience. When you click into these characteristics, you'll find a suite of resources, um, lots of support tools, really practical. These have come, majority have come from practices developing it um, and they're, they're open source, they're free to use. So for practices and PHOs, please tap into those, use them, adapt them for your practice. Uh, hopefully you'll find them really helpful. There's some patient advisory group guidelines, confidentiality agreements, and things like that. So um, there's a whole stack of resources there available. Um, so that's on our website, as well as my screen moves. 
Um, also wanted to promote the HQSC and I think, you know, Mira and Sally, you touched on uh, this resource and the consumer engagement in primary care. So that it, again is available on the HQSC website. It's a great booklet. So I recommend to go and have a read of that, uh, particularly if you think of where, where do I need to go to get started? Uh, those are probably two spaces I would recommend to, to look into. So. Um, and last but not least, we always, you know, we've got a Healthcare Home website, but please contact us after this. Um, we've had lots of questions. Yes, we will share both the recording and um, if the panelists are happy, we will share out their presentations. I think I think 10 out of the 15 questions we're asking if we we're going to share that because it was so fantastic, your work. Um, so hopefully everyone's happy to do that and we'll be putting all those on our website, as I mentioned, along with the recording tonight. Our next webinar will be on Thursday, the 20th of May. Um, it's a nine to 11, it's a morning session and it's on collective impact. So please start registering for that. Um, but first, before I close for Karakia, I just want to say a big thank you to our panelists tonight um, on behalf of the collaborative. Really appreciate, you know, coming out in the evening and, and jumping on board and being so open and honest around what you've learned, your experiences, your insight and your challenges. Um, you're doing some great mahi out there and I'm sure there's people on this webinar that have learned heaps and just been inspired to take that step forward um, in the consumer engagement involvement space. And to Anthony, you know, for really setting the scene around patient-centered care and the importance of, of getting that right um, in that space. So. Thank you guys. We really appreciate your time tonight. So you may even get people approaching you for questions afterwards. So, so let's close uh, for Karakia and people can, can move on with their night. <laughs> ki hora te marino, ki whakapapa paunamu te moana, ki tere te ka rori rori i moa i tu huarahi. Kia ora everyone. Hakite. Thanks, Jess. Thank you.